Uh, thanks so much for coming out. My name's Wes. I come all the way from Canada. Um, it's a little bit weird for me to be here. I'm a little bit out of my element because I'm a JavaScript guy giving a CSS talk at a PHP conference. So I thought about like, mm, maybe I should do like a PHP talk. So uh, when it was announced, people said like, oh, like do you, do you actually do Laravel at all? And I don't. And they kept asking, and lots more people came in. Like, like who, in, who invited this guy to this Laravel conference if he doesn't even write PHP? Uh, and I think the more important question is, like, who's inviting all of these Canadians? <laughs> so sorry about that, but... Uh... <laughs> Like, like what, what would be a PHP talk that I could give? Maybe like how to slap together a WordPress theme. <laughs> or uh, maybe like top 10 code igniter tips that I have for you. Or like editing files straight from the server, which <laughs> let's be honest, I know a lot of you do that. But uh, or maybe even like Laravel JS. It's kind of a joke, but I like I wouldn't be surprised if Taylor did it on the flight home and he just announced it. So I'm going to stick with my talk today, which is CSS Grid. Um, these slides are going to have tons of code, tons of examples on it. So if you want to get them and study them a little bit later, I'm going to tweet out the link. I'm at Westboss on Twitter. Um, I make web development courses. That's kind of what I do for my job. Um, I've got one on ES6, one on React, one on Node. Um, I have a couple, a bunch of free ones as well. This one's JavaScript 30, where it's like 30 days of vanilla JavaScript. Anyone actually taken one of my courses before? Thanks, I'll pay you later. Um, but the reason I'm here today is because I have a course called CSS Grid that dives into everything that you need to know about CSS Grid. Um, I also have a podcast, it's called Syntax. Uh, we do this stupid thing called Tasty Treats where we talk, talk about web development every day. Anyone listen to the podcast? Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, this talk, this is like a talk tutorial. Um, it's going to be about CSS Grid, and what I'm hoping is that you're going to leave today with a good idea of like the surface area of CSS Grid, when you might want to reach for it, and all of the different pieces that go into it. Because CSS Grid is actually like a really big thing. When I was building my CSS Grid course, a couple of people are like, like, what are you doing building an entire course on CSS Grid? Like, what's next? Like a, a course on borders and padding? Like, it's actually such a huge thing that it, it actually does require many, many hours of, of learning. So CSS Grid is a brand new layout system in CSS. It's not a framework or a library, something that you add in. It's a new addition to the language that allows us to quickly create flexible two-dimensional, meaning columns and rows, layouts. Um, so we're going to get into some of the core ideas. And really, the idea behind CSS Grid is that you've got a grid, which is like a containing element, and then you have direct children inside of that grid, which are called grid items. Um, so first what you do is you, you take an element, you define it as a grid, and you slice it up into rows and columns. So this is a empty grid that I have here. I've sliced it up into three rows and three columns. Then you take some items and you put them in your grid, and those are called your grid items. And by default, they're going to take up one spot inside your grid. So what does the code behind this look like? Well, the first thing that you need to do is you display grid on your containing element. So it replaces display block, display inline, display flex, all of those things. It's a new display type that we have. Then you go ahead and you can explicitly define your columns. So in this case, I've got a 200 pixel column, a 300 pixel column, and a 100 pixel column. Then you can go ahead and uh, also do your rows, and then we have a third thing called gap, which is the spacing in between each of these things called tracks. So let's break it down. Tracks are columns and rows. So that's the word that we use to collectively refer to columns and rows. These things are called tracks. Uh, you define a grid with display grid that we saw, and then you slice it up with columns by saying something like grid template column 200, 300, 100, that's going to give you three columns, each with the respective sizes that we have. Then you can do the same for rows. No sweat, same thing, 200, 300, they go top to bottom. By default, the grid items are only going to span to fit one grid spot. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this soon, but 
uh, they will not span the entire, they will not span multiple columns or multiple rows, they'll just take up one spot. Grid items can be anything, as long as it's a direct descendant of your containing element. Generally, your containing element's gonna be like a div or a section tag or an article tag or something like that, and then inside of that, you'll have spans, divs, paragraphs, images, anything that's a direct descendant can be a grid item. Um, if you have content that is larger than the grid template column that you have, it's going to overflow with a rigid size. We'll look at how we can actually address that uh, in, in some coming slides. So one of the core concepts behind understanding how grid works is understanding the whole concept of implicit grid and explicit grid. So the best way we can answer like what is the difference between the two is uh, what happens when you have more items than slots. So here I've got 100, 100, 100, two rows of 100, 100, but I've got these extra elements here. Like what happens when you've got more things than you have spots to put them in? Um, and the answer to that is uh, they will start to create extra rows for you. So this is Firefox DevTools. Firefox DevTools is right now the best way you can visualize a CSS grid. And you see this like thick black line at the bottom. And what that does is it signifies is the end of the explicit grid, we only defined three columns, two rows, right? And we're done with the explicit grid. And then since we have more items, the grid's not gonna hide them, it's gonna start to add additional rows for us, and that's where the implicit grid then starts. So, like I said, once you run out of defined grid spots, the explicit grid ends, and the implicit grid starts. Here I've only defined two rows, and it's extended one more row in the implicit grid. The height of the row is defined by the content that lives inside of it. So if I have one really big item, the entire row is going to get taller in this case because it's a row. It's gonna to stretch to fit the biggest item that's in that row. However, you can also set the height of the implicitly created rows. And that's with another new property CSS that's called grid auto rows. So here we have the 100, 100, 100, and then the 100, 100 for rows. And then we have this new property here, it's called grid auto rows. And that says any rows that are implicitly created, make them 300 pixels. So if I had uh, four, four extra items instead of two, then I would have two rows that were 300 pixels high. You can even have a 100% implicit grid. You don't always have to start your grid by defining what columns and rows that you have. You can just start adding things to it. So what I've done here is I've just done display grid and then uh, we ask ourselves, how many columns are there? Well, we didn't define any, so there's one column. Uh, and how many rows are there? Well, there's, we didn't define any rows, so as soon as we hit that first row, it's, it starts the implicit grid that we have, and we'll continue to add them every single item as a new row, and we can easily size those rows by 100 pixel, and that can be a really useful pattern, really small useful pattern that you can use in your applications. Let's talk about axes, um, or a property called grid auto flow. So in Flexbox, you can change the axis from uh, left to right to top to bottom. You can sort of like flip it, and then you just have a bad day because you keep forgetting which properties you have to use to center things along the different axes, right? Um, thankfully, CSS Grid doesn't have the ability to change the axes, but um, once the explicit spots are used up, Additional rows are created. We just, we just went over that, right? Remember I said, like, okay, we have this many spots, but we got some extra, so like, where, where do those go? Well, the grid will just automatically keep building and adding more rows, right? Um, we can flip that to not add extra rows, but to do the opposite, which is add extra columns. So let's just look at a really simple example here. We've got display grid, nothing else on it. And as I add items to my grid, one, two, three, four, they're automatically, the whole thing is implicit, and they're automatically being added as additional rows. Now if we flip that and say grid auto flow column, 
that what that will say is any time that we add additional things to the implicit grid, then add them as columns and that will infinitely just go horizontal, which in most cases is probably not what you want because most websites don't read unless you have like a band and you think you're cool and build a horizontally scrolling website. But uh, most of us <laughs> want to stick with row, which is why it's the default. Um, you can mix and match them, which is pretty cool. So uh, here we've got display grid, grid auto flow column, meaning we're adding them as columns. We define two columns, 100 and 200, but if we add four items to a two column grid, then it's just going to automatically finish the explicit grid after two and start the implicit grid at the beginning of three and four, and we've sized those both to be 300 pixels with the auto columns property. So let's talk about sizing tracks. So remember tracks are rows and columns. Like how do you define what size they are? So far I've just been doing like pixel values, right? So we can specify the width of columns and the height of rows using any existing CSS unit that you have. So here I've done pixels. You can use rems, ems, or I've thrown in some of the bizarre. Anyone ever used ch before? Anyone know what it's for actually? Or what it stands for? Character height, yeah. Is it X or, or, or O or zero? I don't know, somebody look it up. But uh, it's kind of interesting. It's like the height of a, a, a zero character and if you use a monospace font, then you can, they're all the same, which is kind of cool. Anyways, you can use inches or VHs or anything like that. So it doesn't matter. Any existing units that you have in CSS Grid, you can use those to size your tracks. Now, what about percentages? That's the kind of the first thing people reach for because if you're coming from uh, float left and you did your 80, 20 uh, float left and you add up to 100, um, you might be thinking, oh, I'll just use that in CSS Grid. And percentages are fine in CSS Grid when used in combination with like a pixel value or the keyword called auto. So here, let's take a quick look here. This is 80 auto. So that means the first column is going to be 80% and then the other column will be auto, will just fill up uh, the remaining space. And well, that's good. But it's not for adding up to 100%. Because if I have two columns, one 80% and one 20%, but then I have a, um, a grid gap of 20px, like what does that equal? Does anyone, has anyone been a web developer for more than like six years? Like, do you remember the pain that was uh, trying to add up padding, border, and widths before we had calc? Like, I know there's some young kids in the crowd here today, but it was hard, man. It sucked. <laughs> so uh, that same problem comes along with grid, where if you have an 80% column and a 20% column and a grid gap, I always like to think of it as like budget. You got a hundred bucks to spend, a hundred percent to spend. I'm going to put 80 bucks down here and 20 bucks down here and oh shit, I forgot about uh, the tax, which is the 20 pixels that needs to go in between. And before you know it, you've blown your budget and you're overflowing your grid over top of it, right? So the solution to this is not to use percentages to add everything up, but to use something called fractional units. And this is a new unit that's come to CSS uh, along for, with CSS Grid. I like to think of them as free space uh, units. So what I've done here is that's the same grid we were just working with, but I flipped it from 80% and 20% over to 8FR and 2FR, and those things are proportional, meaning that they, this one will take up eight times the free space, and this one will take up two times the free space. I could have also have done uh, 4FR and 1FR, and it would work exactly the same. So the way that these FR units work, is that the browser will first dedicate space towards things that need like a specific amount of room. So uh, you have existing content, maybe you have an image that has a width of 500 pixels in there, uh, fixed size tracks that you already have, grid gap. These things are like, okay, we've already budgeted for these elements in the grid, they need this much room, and then once you've like, paid your, your pixels to all of these elements on the page, then you got like a little bit of extra fun money to work with, right? You got a little bit of extra width in the thing. You say, all right, um, I'm gonna divide this extra space up in proportion to these extra elements, much like flex grow and flex shrink work in Flexbox right now. 
So what I've done here is this t grid template column is 2FR, 500px, and 1FR. And the way that the browser will lay this out is says, okay, like, what are things that have like a hard requirement? Well, uh, the 50 pixel grid gap. Okay, we gotta make sure we pay for that and make sure we pay for that. Uh, and then this, this middle column is 500 px, make sure we pay for that. Okay, so we've we spent 600 pixels of our budget, now we have all this extra fun money to work with and we can just split it up proportionately. This one, one and four get twice as much as three and six. Yeah? <laughs> That's not, I didn't just introduce Nova, but thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are you talking about? Here's a good example <laughs> is, uh, see I just did 1FR, 1FR, 1FR. You think that would give you three equal columns, but it doesn't, why? Because you gotta spend your money first. Because this element is 300 pixel wide, we first give our space to that, and then we give the extra space uh, proportionately to the other ones that need it. Another part of CSS Grid is the repeat function. And that's kind of cool. CSS is starting to get all these little functions, like we've got a, a calc function, and we've got a min-max function, and we're gonna get a color function. A lot of like the things that you're used to in SAS, they're all coming uh, to CSS. And part of what came along with uh, CSS grid is this repeat function. So repeat allows us to repeat CSS grid tracks. And it looks a little something like this. If you want five, 1FR columns, you don't have to write 1FR five times, you simply just say repeat this five times 1FR and it's gonna give you those five. Pretty simple, right? It can be used multiple times in defining a grid uh, on columns or rows. So here what I've done is I've said repeat three times 1FR and repeat two times 3FR. So that still gives us our five columns but I've just like kinda use them together, just like a normal function where you'd be able to, to concatenate a couple of them together. You can mix it with other units, so start off with a fixed 200, then give me three 1FRs in the middle, end off with another 200 on the right hand side. So that's the grid, that's the like parent containing, but like what about the actual things inside of it? How do you size the, the items that are inside of it? Well, um, you, can, you can do this. Like if your element has a fixed width on it, I've grabbed the third thing here and give it a width of 300 pixels, um, and that will size the track, but that's probably not what you want because what it does is it takes everybody along for the ride with it because it will just expand that column or that row if you were setting height on it. So the solution to that, oh, another example is, in that case, I was using FRs, so it nicely expanded. But if you were using a fixed width, 100px, and your item was bigger than the column, it's just gonna spill outside of it, and that's probably not what you want. So in most cases, the best way to size a grid item is not to think about, I want it to be this many pixels wide. It's, it's kind of hard, I think like people kind of got away from this with Flexbox, which is great, but you, you think about uh, how Flexbox, or how you used to do it, where you're like, I want this thing to be this rigid size and this thing to be this rigid side, where with Flexbox it really made us, I like to say, like embrace the flex, where you just kind of like have this fluid thing depending on the size that you have it. And grid is the same way, where we want to size the grid items um, to span multiple spots. So what I've done here is instead of giving it a hard width, I'm just saying take the third item and set the grid column to just span three of those spots. Like, this is like 1999 all over again with tables, right? <laughs> you can just like call span a couple of them. Um, what's interesting about that is like here, lucky, it fit. I, I gave it three, we had three, it fit nicely in. But what if I told it to span four? Well. We only have three spaces here, so what it does is it goes on to the next line and it keeps looking for a space. Um, that's okay, but we end up with these like kind of empty parking spots there because the way that the browser does it by default is that when it goes to layout four, it just keeps going forward, right? So flipping that over to a new property called grid auto flow dense, what that will do is it will um, sort of always go back to the start when it has a new item. So it goes to one. It says, okay, one needs one spot. Perfect, 
Two needs one spot, perfect. Three needs four spots, ooh. Ooh, can't fit it here, next line. Oh, perfect, found, found the spots that we need. But then we go to four, and by default, it just looks forward, it doesn't go back. It's like the original Mario, you can't go back, right? <laughs> but, uh, but with grid autoflow dense, it will always go back to the, um, the start of the grid where there's an empty spot and say like, hey, maybe we could stuff this one in here. It fits, good. And then it'll keep doing that for five, for six, and then we're back on track and it keeps going with seven. So the order can get a little bit goofed up there, um, but if that's what you want, that's a perfect use case for it. Line numbers in, in CSS grid, which is a, a little bit of a quick aside. Um, tracks are numbered by their gutters and not by their, their track. So that means that if you're talking about numbers in CSS grid, it's not uh, one, two, three. The numbers are based on the either side of it. So you're always gonna have one more line number than you actually do tracks. So if I wanna span something multiple tracks, here I'm saying grid column start at two, and end at five, because grid column, this is shorthand for grid column start and grid column end. Um, and by putting the slash in there, you say start at two, span till five, because it's line one, line two, start there, three, four, five, and that's where it's actually going to end itself. If you use negative numbers, if you look back at that example that I had here, you'll notice that there's all these negative numbers as well, which is pretty cool. And what negative numbers will do is it will anchor it from the end of the explicit grid. So here I'm saying grid row start at four and end at the end, end at negative one. And that will span it to the end of the explicit grid. I find this super handy because how often do you want to span a div, a header, something across the entire layout that you have? And all you have to do is say grid column one, negative one, and that will span it across the whole thing. And that way if your, your grid gets wider or narrower, has more columns or less columns, it doesn't matter. It's always going to span 100% across your entire grid. You can specify where an item ends. So this, this example might be a little bit confusing, but uh, let's look at the grid column end, five. So end at five, and grid row end, negative one, end at the bottom. So what we've just done there is we've anchored it to start at the bottom, kind of bottom right-hand corner of the grid, and then we simply tell it to span three, one, two, three, and how many rows span five. So we're kind of starting from the, the bottom and anchoring itself on up into the grid. So in grid, we've got these other, these new keywords called auto fit and auto fill. And it's one of those ones where you'll never remember the difference. You'll just try one and if it doesn't work, it's probably the other one. Uh, <laughs> but I'll attempt to explain the difference to you. So let's say we've got a grid with a flexible width, like every browser ever made. Uh, and you've got 20 px of grid gap in between every single track that you have. And the question is, how many 100 pixel tracks can you fit? And the answer to that is, I don't know, as, depends on how wide it is, right? As many as we want, right? You can't just like say, give me three tracks because three tracks on a phone versus three tracks on a 40 inch monitor would look very different, right? So what we can do is we can use this keyword called auto fill and auto fit and give it a size of track that we want. And we're essentially saying like, repeat as many as you can and make them 100 pixels, right? And in this case, it can fit seven before, it's got a little bit of extra space, but it can't squeeze another one in there, so then it moves on. But if I were to make that smaller, then it's only going to fit two in, because they have to be 100 pixels, but, and then they'll just make more rows. Ooh, that's kind of a fun little, doo -doo 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 -doo. If you ever hear of people call it, there's a problem in CSS called like circular painting. And that's, a, that's an example of what circular painting is where when you hover on, 
it changes the size, but that makes you hover off, which changes the size, which makes you hover on, which changes the size, which makes you hover off. That's what circular, that's a circular problem, and that, that always comes up anytime you do anything in CSS because uh, you could potentially be painting forever uh, because these changes make other paints happen. Um, so what's the difference between auto fit and auto fill? Well, um, auto fill, if you have a grid that is larger than the number of items that you have, you end up with extra space in your grid. And the answer to should we, should we dice it up? Maybe, let's, let's talk about a cucumber for dinner, right? This is, a, I'm winging this, I didn't think of this. But you got a cucumber for dinner, this is probably dumb. Um, <laughs> you dice it up, you got a couple, you got four cucumbers out of it, what do you do with the rest? Do you, do you dice it up and put it back in the fridge or do you keep a hole? Is that dumb or is that good, right? <laughs> So, <laughs> anyways, um, autofill will dice it up and give us those spots because maybe there's a weirdo that likes to eat the end of the cucumber or something like that, right? Um, and where that's helpful is if you had a navigation, sometimes you might want to like, you might have a navigation where all your items are left aligned, but then you have like a sign out button that you want to pop on the right hand side. And keeping it sliced up will allow you to say like grid column end, negative one, and whoop, it'll move it, it'll, it'll anchor it right on the very end, and, and that's really helpful. So almost always I'll be like, why not? Dice it up, we might eat it. So, so why, why do we have this? Well, auto fit and auto fill are really meant to be used with this new thing in CSS. Is another function called min max. Um, and if you can guess what it does, it takes a min and a max. Uh, and what it will do is it works along with auto fit and auto fill. So this is something I might get tattooed on my chest because this is probably one of my most written lines of code in the last year or so. So grid template columns, make these columns. Repeat how many times? As many as you possibly can. How big should your items be? Well, at a minimum, they should be 350 pixels because that's about as small as I want them to be. At a maximum, I want them to be 1FR, stretch across the whole freaking thing if, if you want to. And what that allows us to do is like these things are not 350 pixels wide, but they're, they're taking up that one free space that's left. But if I start to resize it, doo -doo 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 -doo, um, and as soon as we hit that right there, see these, these are about 350 pixels right now, that four is 350 pixels, and right when I hit that, that break point right there, it says, it's not even, not a media query break point, but what, once I hit that size, it says, okay, now I'm 340 pixels, that's too small according to the min-max calculation, so uh, I need to break on to the next line. And that's really cool because you can just fit as many as you possibly want inside of them and then you also don't end up with any extra space to the right of your grid like some of those earlier examples that I had and it will all go all the way down to just one that we have there. And that's really cool because it's like responsive without media queries. Like what I was doing there was like the responsive that we were doing like five years ago where you're resizing your navigation to be like, all right, this, at this many we're going to have this wide and at this many we're going to make it 25% wide each item and then, then we're going to make it 50% wide and then we're going to make it 100% wide. You don't have to set any media queries with that, it just works. Um, it's container aware, so it's not based on the viewport. You remember Taylor was up here yesterday showing those cards at the top and then he made one a little bit wider and you lost your mind? So that, <laughs> wouldn't that, What's cool about that is that you can, you may, we're like, we're all about like building components, right? And you don't know if the component is going to be in a small space or a really wide space or a short space or a really tall space. And uh, by having these things aware of their container, not the viewport, um, it's, it's kind of like a gateway to uh, container queries, really. It's handy as heck, which is swearing in Canada. Um, <laughs> It, it's, it's one of our most used parts of grid. I use this all the time, which is why I say I'm going to get a tattooed on my chest. It's so handy and I find myself writing very little media queries to do stuff because I can just write this stuff in CSS grid and it, it starts to work out. <laughs> 
All right, one other area of grid is called grid template areas. Um, and it's another way to define like where your items go uh, on the grid without having to use numbers. Um, and you use this ridiculous syntax. So first of all, chill out. I know it's weird, but you'll like it. Most people see it first and they're like, oh no, I'm gonna tweet about this because I'm angry. Um, <laughs> But what you do is you can slice and dice your grid, and then you can name the areas with this crazy ASCII syntax. You say, head, 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 head. And we've got a header across the top. Then we've got like a little sidebar, a little ad bar, a little main square, and then right across the bottom, we've got a footer, right? You can kind of visualize how, how it's working. Um, and then this is the Firefox dev tools. It will show you the named areas that you have. It'll kind of slice them up. We've got our header, we've got our sidebar, we've got our ads, we've got our main square, and then we've got the footer all across the bottom. And then all you have to do to put things in that area is simply assign, let's look down here, the header, grid area, head. It just goes there, main, grid area, main. It just goes into the area. And what's really cool about that, we're not dealing with spanning or line numbers or anything like that. And if you want to change the layout of your website, you simply just change the grid template area. So imagine a media query where all you have to do is just change the layout and everything will just go where you initially told it to go, right? Oh, I didn't make it. <laughs> you like that? Yeah, come on. <laughs> I didn't make it. I just learned about it. Um, all right, another, another part of CSS grid is called named lines. So when you name your areas, header, main, add, sidebar, footer, um, you also get uh, what are called named lines because right now all we know about lines are numbered lines, right? One, two, three, four, and then you also have the negative lines where you can start from the bottom, but you can also use like words for your lines. So if you, here I'm using the same thing, I'm saying gutter left, content, content, gutter right, and then I have a footer all across the end. And then by, for free, you'll get these lines where instead of saying grid column, start at one, go to three, or start at two, we can say grid column, start at the content start. So this area is called content. And by just pu putting dash start and dash end onto the end of those lines, that's what they're called, they come along. Uh, they come along for free. And it's kind of cool because you don't have to like remember lines and also if you ever change your template areas, you don't have to rewrite this part of where they start and stop because you're not based on numbers, you're based on areas. You can also create your own names for the lines if you like. So this is another one where you'll look at it and go, what? But look, don't look at any of the square bracket stuff just yet, but we're making this grid right here where we got 1FR, 500px, and 1FR, right? 1FR, 500px in the middle, and then another 1FR in there. But if we want to name them, we can just simply stick the syntax in between them where the lines go, and we can name them whatever we want. And you can put as many names in there. So I'm calling this first line, which is the artist previously known as one, and we're gonna call it sidebar start and site left and then we're gonna give us our one column, one FR, and then we got this line right here, and that's gonna be called sidebar end and content start. And then we got a 500px one, then we have another line called content end. I could do like a right sidebar start there as well. Uh, and then finally, we have another line called site right. So I've seen people put six or seven different names in there. Um, it's kind of cool that you can, you can name them all as you want, and then you can go ahead and use them in your grid column and grid row layouts. Now, alignment and centering, this is probably, along with the, the grid layout, uh, this is probably one of my most used parts of grid, it's just lining stuff up, because like, I'm sure all of you, especially like backend devs, love to talk about how hard it is to center things in CSS, uh, but it's, it's not a problem anymore. Uh, so CSS grid is amazing if you just use it, 
for aligning elements inside of it. Not, not even if you're thinking about like dicing it up into columns and rows and all of this stuff. You, you kind of think of it as like a big website, but maybe you have like a header of a little widget or a couple buttons on the bottom of a video player. Uh, these are great use cases for just aligning when you have lots of little finicky things. So there's six alignment properties in CSS Grid, and we're gonna go through them all now. So the first one is the justify dash whatever. Those are for the row access. That's your horizontal alignment. And then you have your align dash a couple of properties and those are your vertical uh, alignment properties. So this is the example that we're gonna be looking at for all of these where you have a grid and we got three columns and that's about it. Now, let's go into the first one, which is justify content. So uh, this is how you align the tracks themselves, not, the, not the, the things inside, but the actual tracks themselves. So what we can do is, and, and this is when you have like a grid that is wider than the actual tracks that are inside of it, right? Because this grid is probably 600 pixels wide, but I've only used up 300 pixels plus a little bit of gap in order to use it. So like how do I align those tracks inside of this grid where I've got a little bit of extra wiggle room? So uh, you can justify content, center, obviously it'll center them inside of the grid. You can put it at start. Um, so previously in Flexbox it was flex start. Um, you are now able to just use start in both Flexbox and in, in grid, which is cool. Um, same thing with gap. Right now it's grid gap, but it's, it's a proposal and it's been approved that you can not use grid gap, just gap. But it's, it's not in all the browsers, so yeah, just sit on that for a bit. Um, Justify content end, obviously it puts it on the end. Space between, this one's really helpful, so it'll just take the extra space and put it in between all of your elements. And then we have space around, which will evenly distribute the extra, whoa! Da, da, da. There we go. It'll evenly distribute the extra space in between each one. You might be looking at that and be like, that doesn't look very centered. Does anyone know like why it would do that? Like why is this bigger? Yeah, they all have the same space, but there's a grid gap that also plays into it. So if you're looking for perfect, uh, perfect centerability, you'll take the grid gap off uh, on that specific example. Um, now, justify item. So we, we just did justify content, which was where, how do you center or align the actual tracks themselves? Um, and then once you have the tracks where you want them to be, um, what do you do with the items that are inside of the actual tracks? So by default, the item, which is the yellow box, they will just stretch to fit the entire track. And that's every example we've been looking at so far today. And that's, in most cases, that's probably what you want. It'll just stretch the element to, to perfectly fit it. However, you can also center them. So we've got these three tracks now. You, you can't really see them, but the items inside of the track are now going to be centered. They can be start. They can be end, um, and then you can also override specific ones if you want just one of them to be, uh, and that's where you just put it on a grid item. Not on the grid itself, but on a grid item, justify self, end, and that will override the, uh, the one on the main one. Next we have align content. Uh, and remember what we said about align dash is for the vertical uh, alignment. By default, align content stretch, like we said before, it'll just stretch the actual element, but we can center them, we can start them, we can end them, uh, we can space around, and we can space between, just like we, we looked at on the other ones. Uh, and then finally, we have align items, which is for aligning content inside of the tracks. So by default, stretch, center, start, end, and then this one's really cool, baseline, where it will, if your content is of different font sizes, or if you have like many lines of, of, of text in one and only one line in another one, it will just put like a, a line underneath the bottom line of text and make sure that all of the text is, is lined up regardless of, of how large the actual element is itself, which is pretty nifty. Um, and then you can override the align self. And this is actually one like big benefit over using Flexbox is that um, on Flexbox you cannot override on both axes. Oh shit. 
Should I uh, reopen? Is everyone blowing me up right now? Is that why it, it uh, um, what was I saying? Yeah, Flexbox, it only has the ability to overwrite on one of the axes. I think it has, it has align self, but it does not have justify self. Um, and CSS Grid will allow you to overwrite on both axes, which is awesome. So, woo, that is a kind of a high level overview of all of the different pieces of, of CSS Grid. Um, there's really a lot more uh, to CSS Grid and, and diving into lots of different examples and lots of different edge cases. Obviously, it's at my free course at cssgrid.io. Um, there's the whole topic of CSS Grid versus Flexbox, like they're not competing, but they kind of are, and I think I've got a little bit of time. I can probably talk about it quickly. So. Flexbox is one access, meaning one, you, it can go left to right, or right to left, or top to bottom, or bottom to left, right? And it does have this wrap, where you can wrap onto the next line, but it's kind of a pain in the ass, especially when you want to have even, there's no concept of gap in Flexbox, and it's not really meant, uh, meant for that, whereas CSS Grid is, is meant for, for multiple axes. However, that said, CSS Grid and Flexbox do have a lot of overlap in the alignment, in a lot of the, if you have a lot of cards and you want to display them. What I found myself is almost Almost always I reach for grid um, and there are three or four in my grid course I have like a here is something that only Flexbox can do and then I have another one where it's here is something only uh, grid can do. So there's a couple of use cases where each one excels at it and you'll have to reach for it but I do find if of course if the browser support supports it I know some of you still only have browsers that you can use Flexbox in. If, if that's the case, then go ahead and use it. But I, I, I tend to reach for CSS Grid, even if it's a single axis, because there's a lot more alignment properties that you can do, and if it ever does need to, to go into multiple lines, it does ever need to wrap around, then it's really easy uh, to bring that out. Uh, real website use cases. So uh, that's another thing that's in the course is like today we've just been looking at boxes with numbers in them, right? But like what about actual divs with things in them and video players and actual web, web content in it? Lots of examples like that. Uh, component examples, I talked about that where if you have lots of little like buttons and, and headers and footers and little tool tips and things like that, CSS Grid is perfect, is as, as perfect as it is for like overarching website layout. It's also really, really good for the finicky little alignment of small pieces of, of your application. Uh, dev tools, Firefox has really good dev tools for this. Uh, Chrome's dev tools are pretty good. They're getting much better for it. It's really good to be able to visualize it. Mobile and media queries, there's a whole kind of, you don't have to write a whole lot of media queries with Grid because of the stuff I showed you earlier, but you can kind of relay out your entire website. There's reordering of elements. So if you hit a media query and you all of a sudden want to put your header below your nav, you want to flip the order of them, you can easily do that just like we can in Flexbox. You can just reorder the elements on the page. Overlapping elements. One like little like hack or, or handy tip with uh, CSS Grid is that it's perfect for overlapping elements. If you have two grid items and you just put them on the same gr grid column and grid row, they will just overlap and then you use the index to, to play them or you can use opacity. And that's great because you almost never have to reach for position absolute ever again when you're using CSS grid because you can just easily overlap them by putting them in at the same grid spot. Yeah, yeah, it's not that cool. <laughs> Uh, dealing with an unknown number of items, um, that's something a lot of people use Flexbox for, we're like, I don't know how many things are gonna go into here, and, and that's something you can, you can sort of reach for the auto fit, auto fill, and the min max for. Uh, dense block fitting grid, so one of the things that we have been forever trying to do in web development is the holy grail Pinterest layout uh, in, in CSS, and I'm sorry to report it, it's actually really not, still not possible with um, CSS Grid. It's actually more of a CSS columns kind of thing, but you can kind of make it work with the auto flow dense that I showed you earlier, as long as you have lots of extra little things that can fill in the cracks uh, once you've laid out your, your big items. 
Um, full page, full bleed page layout, that's something that's really popular in web design. CSS Grid is, is really perfect for that. So CSS Grid is absolutely huge. There's a huge surface area of it. Um, I'm really, really excited about it. I think it's the future of doing any sort of layout. So uh, if there is one thing that you say, hmm, like maybe I should like skill up a little bit on front end layout, this is where you probably should be spending your time. So I think it's time to, to get at it. And uh, I think that's it for today. Thanks so much for coming out.